back after lunch. Can I just check that everyone can hear me okay? Yeah? Very good. Can anyone not hear me? You won't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. So this morning we talked about metta mainly as a, a way of conduct, a behavior, an attitude or an intention. And uh, this afternoon I want to talk about uh, metta meditation as a cultivation, sort of methodical method by which we can enter into deep states of stillness, otherwise known as jhanas, but any kind of stilling of the mind is very beneficial as a basis for insight. And I mentioned earlier that uh, the reason that samadhi is necessary for insight is not only because it provides happiness to the mind, but also because it... Uh, purifies the mind of what we call the hindrances. So the five hindrances of craving, of ill will, or any kind of aversion. You know, and craving also includes any kind of wanting for something other than what's right here, right now. And then tiredness, restlessness, and doubt. And the Buddha called the hindrances imperfections of the mind but weak in wisdom. And another uh, translation for hindrance is like a, an obscuration or a curtain or a veil. So you can imagine something that's hiding the truth behind that curtain. And it's very interesting when you start to take these uh, hindrances away from the mind, because sometimes it really does feel as though you're going behind something into a deeper reality that was always there, but that we just couldn't see because it was masked by these screens. And uh, the other definition that the Buddha used was that um, hindrances are nourishments for delusion. So they actually feed delusion, which is very interesting, because, of course, delusion is, is that which obscures the truth again, and it bends perception in a way that's you know, further away from the truth. So the actual definition for delusion is <coughs> seeing uh, things permanent in that which is impermanent, or taking a self, you know, seeing a self, perceiving a self in something which is actually not self. Yeah, or, or taking something which is inherently suffering as happiness. So this is delusion. It actually distorts the truth to be 300 and, or is that 180 degree opposite from what it really is. So the, the hindrances are what feed and strengthen that delusion. And so my teacher calls them public enemy number one. <laughs> but I like to think of them more as private enemy number one because they're enemies, of course, to people external, you know, to society and to our friends and family. But... Mainly, they're hindrances to our own practice and development of the heart. So, it's not that we need to see them as enemies. You know, one of the methods of undermining these, of course, is the kindness and, you know, not responding to them with more aversion or more craving, but allowing them to be there and learning not to feed them. Yeah. So, metta is a way of undermining those hindrances. And the other thing that the Buddha said about this is that when one doesn't have the deep states of samadhi, the hindrances can invade the mind and remain which sounds very ominous, you know, <laughs> they come in and they stay there. But, you know, when we do develop deeper states of samadhi, for the moment we get a clearing and we're able to see something that we haven't perhaps seen before. Because insight is never what we expect it to be, it's something different. That's why it's insight. If we already knew that and we already experienced and internalized that, we wouldn't need to do any more work. You know, so we may think we understand non-self, for example, but actually as we practice samadhi, we see that it's the self that keeps on interfering with the process. You know, thinking, oh, this should be going faster. Or even just, let's have a look what's going on now. <laughs> you know, I often get this. There might not be a, a strong sense of aversion or restlessness, but there's this little kind of assessor in the background having a look at what's happening, how it's working, what's going on. Yeah? And just kind of interfering. I call it the sticky fingers <laughs> of the mind getting involved. So these are all ways that you know, we, we're unable to see the truth because of that. So the particular aspects of metta, which are really helpful for samadhi, if you like, like the sort of defining characteristic of samadhi developed through loving kindness, is that uh, it gives us a head start on happiness. Yeah? I said earlier that for samadhi we need to have a happy mind. And uh, if the mind's still kind of discontent, it's very hard to settle. It's very hard to find peace inside, peace with the body relaxation. So happiness is really important and it gives us the courage as well to proceed further. It undermines the fear that can come up or the excitement because it helps us to be content with where we are. Yeah? 
So meta is particularly helpful for this because by nature it, it usually goes along with a corresponding physical feeling of pleasure and that transforms into an emotional feeling of love, of care, of warmth. So meta is really good in this sense and also in the sense of its <coughs> expansive quality. It includes all. It includes all experience, all being, <coughs> and it has a very selfless nature. So it's very helpful to undermine the idea of practicing to get something for me. Yeah. It's more about giving, giving to the process. And for me personally, I find it very helpful sometimes to practice metta when I'm feeling that maybe I'm getting a bit too fixed on my practice and where my practice is going because this isn't about me anymore. Or maybe I just don't really want to do something for me. I want to do something for someone else. And by practicing metta, I also have the sense that I'm serving. Yeah. So sometimes it's not a, enough of a motivational factor to think about my own path and practice. I'm just one little being. Does it really matter to the state of the world? You know? But when I think I can take another person and I can practice and share metta with them, having confidence that it does have an effect, then it gives me more motivation to practice. It engages the mind. So I think this is also a speciality of the metta. Yeah. So this, of course, corresponds with the second and third noble truths as well. So some people feel that um, samadhi practice is a kind of a striving or a kind of a strong conditioning or building of something which isn't really there. But in fact, samadhi is a state of defabrication. It's a less conditioned state. Because by practicing samadhi, we're actually undermining craving, we're undermining aversion. And these are the things that build a sense of self. They build suffering, if you like. Yeah. So it's the, it's the second noble truth. Wanting leads to suffering. Yeah. Any kind of wanting. Wanting to be happier or wanting to be... Sometimes we even want to be angry. You know? Sometimes the sense of self is really perverse. And we feel like if we're angry, we exist. So, you know, I have a right to my anger. <laughs> it's very common, actually. And in the suttas also, the Buddha talks of, you know, somebody practicing feeling that I want power. I want to be, you know, powerful and have power over others. So, yeah, the mind is very, very tricky, and especially the sense of self, which wants to be. You know, if we find any way to be, <laughs> rather than not to exist. Yeah. Whereas the third noble truth is all about letting go. Letting go, giving up, freeing freeing ourselves from our self-concern, freeing ourselves from, from anxiety, worry, fear, and just giving to the process. So for me, I mean, understanding non-self at the intellectual level is helpful, but it's much easier to understand that as part of the process of meditation. So I think one of the first insights that the practice of samadhi can give is about process, that samadhi is a process. Yeah? And when we get a little bit of joy in the beginning, that process starts to happen naturally. So in the suttas, again and again, the Buddha says that from a happy mind, rapture or PT arises. So PT is the kind of pleasure that you may feel through the body or in the mind, a very subtle but very enjoyable sensation, maybe tingling or <coughs> some kind of energy in the body. Yeah? And it starts to wake the mind up. And then he says when you have this kind of PT in the body and the mind, there's no need to wish may joy arise or may happiness arise because it's a natural outcome of the PT that happiness arises. Yeah. I think actually it's tranquility first. So the PT settles down and then tranquility arises. So that's a kind of calming of the PT which is even subtler than that sort of very stimulating happiness. And then for one who is tranquil, he said, there's no need to wish may happiness arise because it's natural if your mind's tranquil that you'll feel happy. Yeah. So much of the burden's already been put down. And when the mind's happy, samadhi becomes easy. And that's another direct benefit of metta. When the Buddha talks about the benefits of metta, it's not only at the societal level, but he also says one with a, who practices and cultivates metta carefully easily enters samadhi. So sometimes, you know, the reason we're not going deeper in our practice is this very subtle underlying sense of ill will or aversion, which we might not always notice, especially if we're not an overtly angry person. But quite often this ill will is directed internally towards ourselves. We really lack a sense of self-compassion. With my friend that I talked about earlier, who was, uh, whose funeral I attended, I was uh, helping her in the last days of her life just to get some sort of stability and confidence in her mind. 
and to keep her mind steady because she had lung cancer and I think being asthmatic I understand how probably not what it's like to have lung cancer but certainly how it feels not to be able to breathe you know and it's very frightening and I think you know obviously it creates anxiety because you want to grasp you know gasp for air so I was just trying to sort of calm her and do some meditation with her but sometimes that wouldn't work so one day I decided that we could reflect on her good deeds and I thought it would be so easy because she's done so many good deeds and uh, is a very charitable person and the kind of person that just takes you in as a child or as a, yeah, as a friend. For me, she was almost like a mother. Yeah, it was the kind of unconditional acceptance and hospitality that I've only ever experienced with family members until then, really. And, uh, and so we sat down and started to reflect. And I said, can you tell me, you know, something that you've done in your life that you feel happy about and that, you know, brings that happiness to your mind now? No, 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 I've done nothing, she said. <laughs> I said, uh, uh, what about right now? You know, you're hosting me in this house, keeping me well fed, and through doing that, you know, you're actually strengthening the, the Dhamma because we're going to develop a monastery in this country. Oh, yeah, yeah, but that's nothing, that's nothing. <laughs> and, and this carried on for a while, bringing up different things that this lady had done, and that included hosting many monastics when they came through London. It included working for the Guide Dog Society, um, going to all kinds of different Buddhist temples, but also, yeah, donating to hospices and all kinds of things and just being a generally nice person. So she couldn't think of any of them, and I actually had to take something she'd done and get her to repeat it after me. So we started to do this repetition thing. So I'm like, I have supported many monastics. I have supported many monastics. (laughs) (laughs) But bit by bit, she started to do it, and she was like, oh, yeah, I never thought of it like that. And the difference after about, probably took 10 minutes to get going, but then after another 10 minutes, she was just radiant. She was absolutely glowing, you know, and that was just through recollecting her own good deeds. And of course, if one can do this in daily life, you can take that happiness, which is wholesome, which is nothing to do with the sense pleasure or anything addictive or, you know, that endangers anyone else. And you can put it straight into your meditation, yeah. You can just take that same kind of joy and observe the breath with that in mind or observe the body sensations with that in mind as if you're just bestowing them or imbuing them with love, imbuing them with warmth. And this is really gives you a head start in the practice. So I wanted to talk a bit about what... This is one kind of wisdom that the practice can give you, you know, that the less you hold and the less you strive, the more happiness starts to arise. It's as though the more you relinquish, you're just giving joy a a kind of space to be felt. Because as long as we feel there's a lack, we'll always be looking for something that's not really there. And we're not sensing what is there. And then the other way in which um, samadhi, and particularly metta, can give rise to wisdom is in seeing how conditioned our perception is. So, for example, imagine the mind when it feels pretty run down, tired, irritated... You know, not in the best of moods. Even if you meet a really dear friend, you'll sort of find fault. You'll feel a bit irritated with them. And you'll think, oh, I wish they didn't talk so much, you know. And yet in another day, when the mind's full of metta and resourced and energized, you meet the same person and see them in a totally different light. Right? So I had a really interesting experience in Perth because I was in um, a Dhamma talk with my teacher and it was on one of my favorite suttas. And uh, until that day, there'd been another lady in the class who constantly ask questions sort of every 10 minutes and the question would be more like a a monologue (laughs) and I was getting a bit irritated by this but in this particular class I completely got carried away and I started asking all these questions and I didn't realize until the end when my teacher said um just maybe let someone else ask a question oh my goodness what have I done (laughs) I felt quite mortified and I I immediately went to him afterwards and I said I'm really sorry you know I, I was just asking too many questions Oh, yes, you were just interested, he said. You know, because he never has any, anything negative to say, really. Um, but it wasn't enough for me. I really felt down on myself. So I went to um, another friend and I said, I'm really sorry about that. I know that I was asking a lot of questions. Yes, that's right. You know, <laughs> at least you know it, she said. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, so I realized I had some work to do and I needed to talk to some more people. So I went to various people in the kitchen the next day and and it was really interesting because the next person I asked, they said, oh, did you? I didn't notice that. Anyway, I don't really mind. 
Another one said, I was so grateful for your questions. They were really deep. (laughs) And then another one, who was a friend of mine, she actually said, thank you so much. I've decided I want to ordain. And I was like, wow. (laughs) Okay, this is... Which one's right? Yeah. And I started realizing none of them were right. It's just entirely conditioned by that person's own value system, background, conditioning, upbringing. It had nothing to do with me at all. So all those people have a totally different perception of the same situation. But even the same person will perceive the same situation differently at different times. Yeah. Another really nice experience I had last year in the Rains Retreat was um, I already spoke about the meta practice I was doing. And I wasn't getting very far in my... uh, I didn't think I was getting very far in my meditation. Wrong thought, wrong view. (laughs) Um, But I I did identify that there was some irritation there and that maybe I could use some metta. So that was when I practiced this healing metta towards me as the child at the end, or maybe the harmed person at the end of the walking path. And uh, that day I'd had a lot of irritation arising because I was sitting, beginning my two-week personal retreat, and I was staying in a cottage on my own. And all day long, the roof kept banging because of the sun. It expands the roof, and it goes boom. So you're sitting there nice and peaceful. And it just goes boom. <laughs> and it was going on and on at the most unexpected times. And I thought, you know, how you look into the future with the same negative mind. So I thought, for two weeks? How can I stand it for two weeks? Totally wrong view. And... Uh, that evening I did the meta practice and the next day I sat down to meditate and I noticed a couple of bangs but I realized I had no aversion at all I was like oh, it's fine and then the day passed and the meditation started to build I did everything my teacher said stopped interfering you know, just sat there and allowed the energies to to build and the mindfulness to develop and the joy started to arise and by the end of the day I realized I had not even noticed the banging roof <laughs> So it wasn't just about my relationship with it changed. Perception actually conditions, like the state of your mind actually conditions what you're aware of, what you notice. Yeah? It's really, really interesting when you start to see this because you realize you can create your own world. And the thing is, if perception is so malleable and it's so changeable, why not choose the one that leads to wholesome states? Right? Any of them are only approximations of the truth. But if there's less ill will in the mind, it's more likely to be closer to the truth without the hindrances. Yet it's not ultimate truth yet, right? So that's why the Buddha said you can, you can start with metta as a motivation, but then later on use metta to overcome the remaining hindrances in the mind <coughs> and go into deeper states of samadhi. But then the nice thing is that he said that's not the end of it either. There's more wisdom that you can gain from practicing metta and and developing these states of samadhi. And the first one was that you can reflect on karma. You can understand that, you know, I can't take my body with me when I die, but I will be taking all the deeds, all the results of my deeds that I performed in this life. So if I develop metta, if I, you know, overcome ill will, then there's only going to be a happy destination for me, whether or not you believe in rebirth, but you can experience that happiness right now in this life. And if you're not generating anger and ill will, then it's very, very unlikely that you can break any of your precepts. So you become a source of harmlessness for other people, someone that people feel safe around, people can trust. So this is one thing, you know, looking at the kamma. But also, the other one he said is that when you've practiced the metta and you've spread it to the four directions, so we encompass all beings to the, this direction, this direction, each quarter, it was it was known as, so it embraces everybody. And after doing that, we can reflect that all those beings in this direction, in the other direction, all of them are subject to suffering. Our bodies, minds, perception, consciousness, sensations, all the five khandhas are subject to suffering. And the Buddha used very emotive, evocative language. He said they are like a disease, a boil, or an affliction disintegrating, empty, and non-self. Now, these words sound quite difficult and perhaps challenging, you know, when we sort of bring them up in this context, but I think the idea of practicing the metta to the level of jhana first is that it makes us ready to see this without causing the mind to be upset. Yeah? 
So rather than thinking, oh gosh, I don't want to see that, there must be some happiness. It's okay that these things are not happiness because you have another source which is much more refined, much more beautiful, more reliable and consistent. Yeah? So I think often we go into insight practices too soon. And it's fine to be you know, developing and learning about our practice and about life through our meditation from the very beginning. We must. You know, it must go hand in hand with calming the mind. But for the deeper insights to arise, they need a very, very strong and happy mind which is almost cushioned by these practices so that difficult emotions or, or um, what do you say, insights that might otherwise shake the mind will just bounce. Yeah? And they'll, or they also might penetrate much more deeply because the mind's soft, it's not brittle. It, it can penetrate, it can absorb and actually transform the mind much more deeply. So I think it's really interesting to see that, you know, these things do contribute to wisdom in a very deep way. And in particular with metta, I think it makes that easier because of the happiness it bestows. And then lastly, he said that you can actually develop insight through practicing metta by reflecting on those states of metta, the jhana states, whether through metta or compassion or even anapana, whatever they are, you can reflect on them as conditioned, volitionally produced and therefore impermanent and subject to cessation. Yeah. So these are almost the exact words. <laughs> I've tried to remember the quotes. So because I think the words that the Buddha uses are very powerful. And I particularly like the phrase subject to cessation. Yeah. So it's not just that the metta in its nature is changing, it's actually subject to complete cessation. Because when the mind stops, of course, all the qualities it carries also stop. Right? So meta states are something that arise and something that disappear again. They don't belong to us either. And so we realize that we can cu cultivate these states, but in the end, we don't take them with us. When the causes for them are not there, then they vanish. They disappear. So that's not the ultimate aim. In the suttas, the uh, jhanas achieved through metta and achieved through anything, I think, are called the vimuttis, which mean the liberation but it's important not to mistake that for full liberation. That means you're liberated from the five sense world. Right? So you're enjoying the pleasure of the mind, not of the five senses. Yeah. But that's not the end of it. <laughs> so I think it's very, very useful. Some people take metta as the main vehicle for their practice. But whether you do that or not, I mean, to add that kindness from the very beginning and to make sure that you're motivated by this wish for others... Um, happiness and others' well-being is really powerful and prevents us from falling into a sort of spiritual materialism or some kind of dissociative spirituality which is okay in given conditions but struggles when it comes into contact with difficult circumstances in life. So it helps us to engage. It helps us to engage with all of life. So there are two main ways that... Um, the cultivation of metta is discussed in the suttas, and one is in the suttas and one is in the commentaries. So in the suttas, uh, the Buddha talks more about metta in terms of its expansive nature, yeah. so a kind of spatial expansion. So that's why he usually talks about sending metta to the four quarters. Yeah? And he uses the phrase um, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. I will abide, pervading the four quarters with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Yeah? And to all as to myself, which is really nice. Because I think uh, maybe one of the differences between Christianity and Buddhism is that in Christianity, sometimes they talk about loving the neighbor even more than oneself, or this idea of self sacrifice, you know, giving everything for someone else. But in the Buddhist suttas, it actually says, to all as to myself. So it includes you equally. Otherwise, again, there's this sense of self is very strong. Yeah. Everybody else is fine, but I'm not good. I'll spend my whole life helping others because, you know, it kind of covers up my own feeling of not being good enough. So we need to include ourselves in that. But he doesn't talk about individuals. He just says, to all is to myself, and spreads it to the four quarters. Yeah. So that's about the spatial, expansive quality. So less on focus and more on direction and inclusion yeah 
And the other interesting thing in the suttas is, is that uh, I think there's a few places where he does talk about individual people, and most of the time he's saying to spread it to people who you're annoyed with first. And I think this is quite different from the way we're often taught, because often we're taught to spread it first to the loved person, which I'll explain in a while, and it's also very good. But in the suttas, it often says that you know if uh, you're irritated or angry with a person, practice metta to them. And I think the reason is is because you're harming yourself. Every time you think of somebody with ill will, you're harming yourself. And if you stop it early on, it stops it escalating. So I also had an experience uh, with this during my rains retreat. It's a bit controversial to talk about this, but what the hell, I'm a bikini now. (laughs) I might as well be controversial. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I was in the rains retreat with my teacher in his community and uh, although he obviously supports gender equity, especially in the Sangha, especially through the bhikkhuni ordination, there were still some aspects of patriarchy in that monastery, which I was finding quite difficult. And one of them was um, always having to be at the end of the line. <laughs> it didn't used to bother me so much, but somehow now that I'm sort of leading a, a new monastery in this country, I feel like I want to give my female supporters something to feel proud about and also... I think by going at the end of the line, it sort of hides the commitment that women are making to this path. No one can see all those years that you've put into it, you know. And it's not important from my own perspective, but I think it's nice for people to know that women are sincere practitioners over years and years and years. So um, I was feeling a bit irritated about that. And then one day, one of the young monks, well, he's not a young monk, he's been a monk for a long time, but he's actually not fully ordained. But he obviously thought he was senior, so he pushed ahead of me. Ha! How dare he? You're not supposed to have physical contact. You know, my mind was going off like this. (laughs) So I walked out of the arms round, and then I realized that with this state of mind, my meditation wouldn't really happen that day. So so I remembered this instruction, you know, to send metta to the person who you're irritated with. And I just reflected on his qualities and remembered that a few years previous I'd asked if I could stay in the monastery for six weeks and he was the guest monk sort of dealing with the applications and he'd uh, looked at the book and saw that there was actually an extra week between me and another guest and he'd said you can stay seven if you want Uh, I mean I love staying in that monastery so when I remembered that I just thought yeah (laughs) you were really kind to me at that point you know and you must be suffering I mean it must be hard being at the back of the line even though he's very senior you know, okay, he doesn't understand my situation, but I'll be kind to him. So I sent Meta to him. And then I realized, yeah, I'm still not really happy with the whole system, so maybe I should send it to everyone. So I sent it to each monk, and remembering as much as I could about each monk, how they, you know, their qualities, their kindnesses, which are many, 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 many. And, uh, and then in the end of that, I imagined us all inside the Buddha's heart, like all just held there, you know. Realizing that life is just imperfect. You can't have the perfect monastery, the perfect lunch procedure. You know, I don't know about here, but maybe some of you are pushing in or some of you are you know, waiting too long or whatever. But that's just human nature. That's life. So I realized that. And after that, it really didn't come back again. Hardly at all. And I also started to just notice the people that you know, maybe were a bit ignorant really about the effect of their behavior and the fact that it was upsetting more than just me some of the monks were very upset about it too and I just started to be extra kind to them and say would you like some of this you know and we started putting food in each other's bowls which was really lovely (laughs) you know and sort of remembering what each person liked and that kind of thing so it all it all kind of yeah it changed with that and I think that can be the advantage of sending metta immediately to someone you're irritated with. You don't give it a chance to take root. Yeah? So that's what is often talked about in the suttas, and I don't know the exact place, but Ajahn Brahmali is the, the genius on all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the other way of uh, practicing metta, which is more common, perhaps, and maybe most people have, been, you know, have heard a lot about, is uh, practicing it to individual people in various categories. And this is actually from the commentaries, mainly the Visuddhimagga, which was... I meant to look for the date, actually, but it, wouldn't have, it would have been a lot later than the suttas. I'm not absolutely sure when. But uh, the advantage of this kind of method is it's, 
it goes through each person systematically. So from the loved person who's easy to develop metatours to the person who you don't have much relationship with, which we call a neutral person, all the way to a person who we have problems with, like the disliked person or even the enemy. So it covers the whole range of people, which means that if you do have some ill will that you've not yet seen, it's going to come out somewhere along the way while you practice. <coughs> so it's very systematic and thorough and a lot more focused than the early Buddhist suttas um, version of practicing metta. And I think it has its own advantages. I sort of think of it like going through that can help you get to the place where you're able to just spread it you know, intuitively. And also the spreading, I think, involves more of a somatic sense. Like if you're more a feely-feely kind of person, it's easier to just have that connection to the emotion, just spread it, just generate it. But sometimes we need a few more seeds in order to do that. So we plant these seeds with various types of people and send particular wishes to each category of people. So traditionally in this uh, commentary also, they start with the self, one self, no self. Anyway, <laughs> and, uh, and this is often quite difficult, I think, especially for people who've been in Western societies or the so-called developing world societies where we have a lot of, uh, I don't know, ill will towards ourself, really, and not a lot of compassion. It can be quite difficult to start off with sending metta to oneself. Although we may be most in need of it, it doesn't come very naturally. Um, and I already mentioned my friend, and, you know, the reflection that we did about her good qualities, I think we can also use this for ourselves to start to break down that barrier towards sending it to ourselves. Yeah. The other thing we can do is um, <coughs> forgiveness, self-forgiveness. Because often we, there's something in our life or something in our past which we still feel, oh, I wish I hadn't done that, I could have done better. You know, and we still not realize that we did do the best we could at that time depending on the conditions we were in and the state of mind we were in at that time, that was our best. You know? And so a little practice of forgiveness, self-forgiveness, can be really helpful to start to soften those walls that we put around ourselves. You know, We keep some aspects of ourselves in and some out behind the wall. <laughs> so that forgiveness kind of includes more aspects of ourselves to come in, into the heart. So we may or may not choose to start with ourselves. One teacher put it very nicely. He said, you can actually start with the loved person and then creep up on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so what you do is pick the person who's very easy to send metta to and uh, somebody with whom you have quite a simple, uncomplicated relationship who, by thinking of you, quickly generate a sense of warmth or maybe they make you smile when you remember them. Maybe a best friend or even a partner or can be a teacher, but I like to keep teachers for the superpower loved person. <laughs> the, the special one for when your meta's running a bit sort of low. I usually have a superpower object that I bring in <laughs> that's guaranteed to bring a lot of good feeling. And, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, the loved person can be anybody who you're close to. Usually it's helpful if there's not a lot of passion and loss between people because it can quickly lead into that. And if that starts arising in the practice, it's not really helpful at all. So, but at the same time, intimacy is an important part of metta. So someone who you have a lot of shared experience with and who you feel very close to, you feel that you understand them, their life, their joys and sorrows, this is really very helpful because you have that interest factor. Yeah? And you can also choose very carefully what you wish for that person and it's usually quite pertinent and quite appropriate. So that's the loved person. And by, using, by creeping up on yourself, you start with the loved person. May you be happy. May you be peaceful. May we be happy. May we be peaceful. Yeah? So you start to include yourself in that. So you don't have to go straight for yourself. It's like you and me. Or the dog and me. Or whatever. My little plant and me. <laughs> so we do it that way. And then the next one is the neutral person. So this is like building a fire. Right? You start with the easy ones, like the kindling on the fire, so it gets the flames going. And when it's going a bit, you put something a bit harder, so that's the, this is the next one, which is a little bit larger, the neutral person. So the wood might be a bit damper or a bit bigger <coughs> because there's not so much interest with the neutral person. There's probably not a lot of hostility or difficulty either. So the neutral person is somebody maybe that you see quite often, maybe someone in the supermarket, although it's getting harder because there's so few people on the till. Maybe the supermarket till. 
But, uh, yeah, somebody who you don't have a lot to do with. It could be a neighbour. You know, there can be a nice, pleasant feeling, but it's not a very close relationship. And then you start practising with them. And it's interesting when you practise with a neutral person, because at first you don't feel a lot, and it maybe doesn't keep your attention very sustained. But after a while, in life, I've noticed, that person starts to... <coughs> I start to notice them more, and they start to notice me more, and there tends to be a feeling of goodwill arising just through familiarity, really. And so gradually they start to change into the friendship category. So these categories are not fixed. They keep changing. And that's the really lovely thing about this kind of practice too. So that's the neutral. And then we can move from them to the disliked person. <coughs> and I think with the disliked person, there runs the risk, of course, of, dan- of um, the danger of aversion arising. But also, if we choose somebody who we have a very difficult relationship with, like a real enemy, I mean, some people have real enemies, you know, there's somebody who's just out to get you, or somebody who you have a very difficult situation with from the past, maybe some trauma, (coughs) abuse, it's better not to choose that person for the difficult person. It's just too hard. And uh, in my life, I did have a very dear friend who turned out to be abusive to me, and... uh, I remember her writing and saying, we just need to send each other metta. And at that time, I just thought, no, I just can't do that. You know, because every time I remember this person, I remember the trauma. So I just realized it's not healthy for me to do that because I'm just bringing up those bad memories every time I think of them. So I just left it aside and continued with the metta practice in a, the usual kind of sequential way and sometimes using a difficult person, but not her. But then one day, I was uh, practicing metta at Gaia House, actually, and... Uh, I decided to do a self-retreat for about 10 days and just focus on meta practice. And I was sending it to my best friend because it was her birthday and getting really happy and really a lot of warmth and, you know, feeling of feeling resourced in myself. And this other person just came in my mind, not intentionally, they just came. And it was like they fell into the flow of meta. They just fell into it. And because the flow was so strong... There was really no impact. It just didn't affect me the same way it usually would. <coughs> Normally when I think about her, I'd get this feeling of dreads in my stomach, you know. Like, oh, what happened there? What went wrong? You know. But this time it just didn't affect me. And ever since then, I think that was the real big shift towards the healing because since then I've been able to think about her without those reactions of stress and, you know, flight, fight responses. I don't get that anymore. So sometimes we don't need to actively try to overcome our our past, our trauma, our pain. It's actually much more skillful to just develop meta where you can, where you find it possible. And later on, as the heart gets stronger and more expansive, other people can come in. So for the disliked person, we just maybe practice with them for a shorter time. And if you see these difficult emotions arising, it's maybe time to go back to the loved person or the neutral person, whatever you feel is possible for you. At other times, the emotions that come up can be quite overwhelming, you know. Maybe you could get a lot of uh, fear arising or anger arising, and then it's not necessarily helpful to continue metta practice. At that point, you could go back to metta as an attitude, right? So you could just choose to address those emotions, those feelings, through embracing them with kindness. (coughs) So perhaps just letting the actual cultivation of metta subside for a while and looking at that emotion and saying, okay, how can I care for this right now? How can I bring my kindness to this in a way that's helpful? So it's a very fluid and flexible practice. But I did want to um, have a little experiment with this practice together, um, probably using the loved person. If any of you want to, you're welcome to use yourself if you feel that there aren't any obstacles to that. But uh, I think the loved person is an easier one to start with, and we can include ourselves if we want to, either later on or during the practice, if you feel you want to change from you to we. May you be happy to may we be happy. Then feel free to do that. Yeah. So we'll do a bit of meditation now for about 45 minutes, if that's okay. Um, and then we'll have some walking and then we'll have a little discussion on metta so that's the chance for us all to ask questions and look at other aspects of the practice together